Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church. And because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. First lesson today we'll be reading from 2 Samuel. You can find it on page 5 of your order of service. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew up, grew up with him and with his children. It was used to eat of his meager fare, and drink from his cup, and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man. And he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb, prepared that for the guests who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against him, the man. He said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, you are the man, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. I anointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you to your, you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom, and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your, within your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this very son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel. And before the son, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. The word of the Lord. Uh, we will read a psalm today, uh, which you can find on page 7. We will read it responsively at the asterisk. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. 
Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And so you are justified when you speak, upright in your judgment. Indeed, I have been wicked from my birth, a sinner from my mother's womb. For behold, you took for truth deep within me and will make me understand the wisdom of secrets. Purge me from my sin, and I shall be pure. Wash me, and I shall be clean indeed. Make me hear, hear of joy and gladness, that the body you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your saving help again, and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. The epistle today is from Ephesians. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling of which you have been called, with all humi humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on the high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fulfill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head in the Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together, together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth building itself up in love. The word of the Lord. Let's turn to your able and sing hymn number 596.
gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, according to John. For it's you, Lord Christ. Now on the next day, when the people who remained after the feeding of the 5,000 saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. And then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. And so they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And then Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the one God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. Please be seated. First, let me say it's a pleasure to be with you folks here at Good Samaritan. I'll be with you all of this month of August for four weeks. And I'll look forward to getting to know you all a little bit better by the end of the month. Let me also say that this week's lessons were so full and so rich that I could have easily preached on any one of the three lessons and had a great time with it. I was very tempted to preach on the Samuel lesson. Um, that um, rated X story that we find in the Bible reminds us that the Bible is not children's literature. This story of sex and theft and murder by God's own chosen child, David, is very much an R-rated story. And it's very tempting to talk about it, but not today. I really decided to continue our online lesson from the Gospel of John. We've been looking at that, this story of Jesus, uh, this story of Jesus healing and teaching at the Sea of Galilee on the hillsides and on the coastal plain, watching him taking care of the crowds that gather around him. And last week, we saw, heard the story, of course, of the feeding of the 5,000. This week, we hear again in that same sort of scene, a continuation of that story. 
It's a continuation of what we already heard last week. And we know it really well, at least I think we think we do. I'm not sure we always really do know what that story is about. So as we listen this week, we see that the crowds are still following Jesus. And they've gone to the other side of the Sea of Galilee with his disciples. And when they meet up with him, following him around on the coast as they, as they went, they got into boats as well, of course, going over to the other side. And when they meet Jesus there, they really um, ask some very strange questions. Rabbi, how did you get here? Well, that shows, of course, that they didn't even get it that Jesus had gone to the other side of the sea in an act of divine glory. You will remember that the disciples were going across in the boat and they were in the middle of a heavy storm. And Jesus comes by them and the disciples think he's a ghost. And of course then Jesus tells the disciples, do not be afraid, it is I and the storm ceases. Well now, the people are asking the same kind of question, where did you come from? And as in many texts throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus deflects the concerns of the people and redirects them in, another, in a series of questions and answers by telling them that they are looking for him, and he understands this well because they saw the sign of the feeding and they simply wanted to get fed again. They wanted another free dinner. Like the Israelites who were taken through the, the Red Sea to freedom and liberation, they too, like the Israelites in the march in the desert, when they got hungry and thirsty, they forgot all about God's liberation and the parting of the sea and his freedom that he gave them, his sustenance, his protection over them. They decided they wanted to go back to Egypt. Well, likewise, here we have another group of people who've already been fed miraculously, and they just wanted to get fed again. So they forgot about what God had already done for them. And they got scared. Now we see in our text for today, Jesus begins to stretch the thinking of the people as we see in other Johannine texts. Remember when Jesus confronts Nicodemus in, in the Gospel of John? He speaks to him about being born again, and Nicodemus doesn't get it, right? Jesus is talking about birthing beyond being born, all right? Well, with the Samaritan woman, again, in chapter 4, he speaks to her about giving her water beyond the water in the well, a water of eternal life. So here also, Jesus now begins to stretch the thinking and the imagination of the people by speaking to them about the bread which is beyond food, beyond bread, which he has provided on the hillside the day before. And then they ask what they need to do to get this bread that Jesus is offering. And Jesus responds again and tends to refocus their thinking. He keeps turning them. They don't need to do anything but to believe the works of God, to see and know where and how God is working in their lives. They need, in, order, in other words, to pay attention to God's work in the world. In John's Gospel, to believe, this word belief, is not a, a, an intellectual ascent, like we say, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, you know, when we do the Nicene Creed. That's not what this is about. 
It's not an intellectual assent to a proposition. It's rather much more like our word to trust. I trust in God. Yes? So here is, I believe, the crux of our gospel this morning. The sign that, God, that Jesus, Jesus performs, and by the way, there are no miracles in the Gospel of John. There are only signs, signs of divine presence. So the people have missed this sign completely because it's not their full bellies that they need to look at, it's the person of Jesus. They need to pay attention to him. The divine power and love of God is in their midst. It's present for them. And they, the people, desperately want to be fed. Now, I suspect at some level it is very much a physical thing. These were poor people, peasants, under the oppressive rule of Rome. They were probably hungry to begin with. That's pro probably true. And so they were looking for the sheer sustenance of a piece of bread. Who wouldn't want that? Yet we should not be harsh with those poor people for not getting it, because we don't get it either. We all know that our own lives are more filled with anxiety and fear about what's going to happen to us than we wish to admit. We all walk around the, this world with a bit of anxiety on our heads, particularly now in this season of COVID pandemic. We're scared, and we have a right to be. But we also, if we truth be told, we're also scared about what's going to happen to us in the future. And what that does to us is makes us scared to live. It makes us clench and clutch to hold on to that which we have already, to hide it away, to hoard what we have. Far from having an open hand and an open heart, we find ourselves closing off to each other, feeling like we need to be fit, fit, feeling ourselves safe and secure for ourselves. Our life's experience makes us more than willing to believe that there is ever enough. There is almost never enough. And what we must do is to keep our hands from grasping ever harder onto what we have. Yeah? I think if we're, if we're honest with each other, that's how we live in this consumer society of ours. This reminds me, when I was in college, I was a psych major, and we had to do experiments with rats. I don't know if any of you back there have ever had to do that. We did these experiments to see how rats behave under certain circumstances to train them in ways that we wanted them to behave. So we put them in one of the, we put them in these boxes called Skinner boxes. And in that box, there was a lever on the wall of the box that the rat could press and get a pellet of food. And we did all kinds of experiments, experiments about under what circumstances the rat would press that lever. So we put the rat in the box, and no food was given. The rat would press the lever several times and then just stop. Nothing there. If there was always food delivered, the rat would stop pressing the lever after a short while when it got full. But when the lever produced food only once in a while, the energy level of the rat went way up. And the rat would keep pressing the lever over and over and over again to 
get that pellet of food. Frantically and continually. You see, what we had succeeded in doing was breeding fear and anxiety into that rat's behavior. Sometimes causing the rat to collapse with exhaustion. I'd like to suggest that we're like those rats. Moving toward exhaustion, feverishly trying to find what we need in this world. It is here that we begin to hear the, with a bit more clarity what Jesus is trying to explain to the people. They knew the story of Moses and the provision of manna and water in the desert. They remembered that story. And they were looking for someone who, like Moses, would lead them out of oppression and violence of the empire, who would feed them and guide them like the prophet of old. They didn't want just food. They wanted action somebody to take care of them, somebody to save them. And when they were fed by Jesus and the disciples, they thought that they had finally found the prophet. And you'll remember from last week's lesson that they tried to forcibly take Jesus and make him their king. And Jesus reminds them, though, as they're thinking about making him king, that it wasn't Moses who gave the Israelites bread. It was the divine Holy One himself. Again, we, like they, often spend our lives looking in the wrong places for what we, what we think we need. We fail to see that it's the work of God in our very midst that provides us with all that we need. This is what we must come to trust and to believe. It is he who is the new life of rebirth. It is he who is the living water so that we not, need not ever thirst. It is Jesus who finally says, I am the bread of life. Again, our gospel is making us work for understanding because Jesus is not just equating himself with food, but when he says, I am, the I am statement, it is the same as the statement made in the, in the Hebrew scriptures when Moses goes up onto the mount and the burning bush and he asks the divine, who is it that I, sh I should go and say that I have met? Who are you? And you'll remember the answer to that question. God says in response, and here we're using the Greek translation, okay? It's not the Hebrew. It says, I am. Ego emi is the Greek. I am who I am. Or I will be who I will be. Or I will become what I will become. Indicating God's presence. It's God who's there. And so Jesus, when he says, I am the bread of life, he is saying, God is the bread of life. The divine is the bread of life. It is this same God self who is present and visible to Jesus, who is bread for our deepest hunger, our water in the midst of life's deserts, and our possibility for new birth over and over and over again to begin to see the reign of God dawning in our midst every day. For the Gospel of John, eternal life is not something in the future. Eternal life is now, right now. It's here, present, and surrounding us. What would it mean for us to begin to believe that? What would it mean for us to trust that all that we need will always be provided for. Could we find ourselves loosening our grip of desperation on that which we have and that which we think we need? Could we find ourselves opening those clinched hands to share our bounty with each other? 
Could we reach out to touch and heal our broken world without fear, without anxiety? Could we offer ourselves as bread, as water for those who thirst, and as bestowers of new life to those under the power of death in our world? Because we have God present among us. The power of the divine is here to heal and to nourish. Jesus says, whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Do you believe that? Amen. Please stand if you're able and let us repeat the words of our historical Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the people, gathered in the name of Jesus, united by the power of the Holy Spirit, let us pray, saying, O oh Lord, bread of life, have mercy upon us. You are the bread of life, O God. You feed us with manna. You satisfy our needs with your word. For the food that never perishes, we thank you. Gather us up with all your needy people, that none may be lost. O Lord, bread of life, have mercy upon us. You call us, O God, to be renewed, to put on a new nature, to conform our lives to your will, form the church into a source of life which feeds a needy world. O Lord, true bread from heaven. O Lord, bread of life, have mercy upon us. In a hungry world, O God, we do not know how to feed one another. Hear the cries of the poor. Strengthen us to answer their need, to dry the tears of those who mourn, to care for the children, to preserve the land, to honor all your people. O Lord, source of manna in the wilderness. We long to embrace you, O God, we rejoice in your invitation to life. Urge us gently into the arms of our sisters and brothers that we may find you there. O oh Lord, font of life. O oh Lord, bread of life, have mercy upon us. Intercessions for God's care and healing for those who have been committed to our prayers. From the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for renewal of faith. We pray for our groups that meet here. AA meetings, Al-Anon meetings, Gamblers Anonymous, Midori Bonsai, Westside Sunnymont Preschool, and San Jose Young Nak Korean Church. 
for people whom we are holding in prayer, for Lynn, Cecilia, Barry, Will, Sandra, Debbie, Mark, Jerry, Penny, John, Jill, Margaret, Don and Jane. Thanksgiving. Thanking God for all our many blessings for the ordination anniversary of uh, Father Joe. For the departed. Praying for those whom we love but no longer see. Jenny, Alonzo, Eric, Mike, Walter, Claire, Adeline, Julius, Augie, Donna and Frank Adams, John Felix, Jane Arden Felix, Kitty, Beverly, Van, Athley, Chung, Harry, Craig, Dee, Jerry, Marion Keplinger, and Mike Conway. Is there anyone else or anything else we should pray for? Please offer your prayers silently or aloud. all of those who are suffering and dying from COVID. Almighty God, to whom our needs are known before we ask, help us to ask only what accords with your will. And those things which we dare not or in our blindness cannot ask, Grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Let us pray together, saying, Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life, amen. And now, my sisters and brothers in Christ, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Share signs and words of God's peace, being careful. Now walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for, for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God.
please stand if you're able. be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church, and because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And we celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death and resurrection and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, 
in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. Now make a special effort to realize the presence of Jesus in your soul and make your act of spiritual communion. Let us pray together. Come, Lord Jesus, and dwell in my heart in the fullness of your strength. By my wisdom and guide me in the right pathways. Conform my life and actions to the image of your holiness. And in the power of your gracious might, rule over every hostile power that threatens or disturbs the growth of your kingdom. Who with the Father and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, for in glory everlasting. In union, blessed Jesus, with the faithful gathered around every altar of your church, where your blessed body and blood are offered this day, and remembering particularly my own parish, I long to offer you praise and thanksgiving for creation and all the blessings of this life, for the redemption won for us by your life, death, and resurrection, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. I believe that you are truly present in this holy sacrament, and I pray you come into my heart. I unite myself with you and embrace you with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. Let nothing separate me from you. Let me serve you in this life until, by your grace, I come to your glorious kingdom and unending peace. Amen. My sisters and brothers in Christ, these are the gifts of God for the people of God.
please stand if you're able and let's engage in the post-communion prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding abide with you all your days and may the blessing of God Almighty, creator, redeemer, and sustainer be upon you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Are there any announcements we need to make? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Our closing hymn is number 660. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia.